You may be seated. Good morning. I just fix this. So, at any opportunity she was given, my grandmother would always recall the tale of a Boobin Adam, which is a 19th century poem by James Henry Lee Hunt. If someone asked her why she wasn't evangelizing more, she would say, because of a boob and Adam. If somebody told her that she should only associate with Christians, specifically Methodists, she would respond, a boob and Adam. I realize that many of you may not be familiar with this poem, but it is short, so I'm going to read it to you. A boob and Adam, may his tribe increase, awoke one night from a deep dream of peace, and saw within the moonlight in his room, making it rich and like a lily in bloom, an angel writing in a book of gold, exceeding peace had made Ben Adam bold, and to the presence in the room he said, what writest thou? The vision raised its head, and with a look made of all sweet accord, answered the name of those who love the Lord, and is mine one, said Abu? Nay, not so, replied the angel, Abu spoke more low, but cheerfully still, and said, I pray thee then, write me as one that loves his fellow men. The angel wrote and vanished the next night. It came again with a great wakening fright, light, <laughs> and showed the names whom love of God had blessed. And lo, then Adam's name led all the rest. So to me, this poem is fundamental not just because it was read to me time and time again by my grandmother, but because it fits perfectly with the belief system that I hold and the soul of that belief system. And that's to know love is to know God, whoever or whatever you believe God might be. Now will you join me in that spirit in prayer as I lead the worship. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning and thank you for giving me a chance to come up to speak. May the words of my mouth inspire and bring people to thought and may they all be for you. Amen. So I grew up in a town of 2,500 people, and now it might be about 3,000 people. I don't know. It's still small. Um, there were 300 people in my high school, 80 people in my class, and there were 13, 14, 15, I don't know. There's always churches, there's more churches being put in the town because they just keep having these denomination wars and they keep breaking up. And there was so many youth groups, so many different youth groups, but there were two big ones. There was youth group A and there's youth group B. Now, youth group A was cooler than youth group B, but youth group B went on better missions trips in the spring. Now, group A had a better worship team, but group B was more legitimately about God and was more, you know, in tune with their faith. So that was, you know, I, I was a part of group B. So, and I'm going to be honest, I started going to group B not because I wanted to find out more about God or anything, but because I had a huge crush on a guy. And I was like, I want to, you know, he, he likes church, so I'm going to go, I'm going to go meet him. And, you know, but after the crush faded, I think I was like 13, I, um, I'd become immersed in this small town youth group state of mind. And it kind of shaped my high school career and what happened after that. Now, there are many things that were great about going to youth group. I mean, I had a good set of friends who were determined to do good and be good people, and they wanted to see me do well, and they wanted to see me do good things. And I also had a place where I could play piano and be on a worship team and hang out with my friends and play music with them, and that just meant a ton to me. And when I was 16, I had a chance, I went on this weekend retreat with some people to Chicago to this conference where we were learning how to evangelize and we were being trained how to evangelize to every type of person and in this they had to explain to us what every type of person was and who every type of person was. They explained how being religious, religious was different from being a true believer in Christ and also how being spiritual was different from both of those. Now they also explained what it meant to be atheist and to be agnostic and pagan and Wiccan and Muslim and they just kept going and they explained everything like they were the experts and they knew everything about that religion. And 
then they explained how we could reach out and talk to these people. And they wanted us to go out and like knock on doors and be like, can we pray for you? Have you heard about Jesus? Learn about Jesus. Jesus is the one you should know. You, you should love Jesus. And, you know, but I really didn't, you know, I didn't really want to do that. I was uncomfortable with that because, I mean, I did love Jesus. I loved the idea of Christianity and the things that God stood for, but I wasn't comfortable telling people that that's what they should believe. And more so, I just wanted to find out what it meant to be Muslim or what it meant to be Buddhist. I didn't want to tell them what to do. I just wanted to learn what their beliefs were about. So I was always confused about these conferences too because the topic of hell was always focused on themes like we want to talk to these people so they don't go to hell. We want to talk to our family because we don't want to see our family in hell and we don't want that to happen. We want to expand the, you know, expand the kingdom of heaven. So let's go talk to these people on the street so then they can go to heaven too. And I wasn't positive about this idea that everyone who was an, wasn't a non-denominational evangelical Christian was going to hell. I wasn't just, I wasn't sure that that's what it really meant, you know? And so I remember when I was young, I asked my grandma, I'm like, do Jews go to hell? And actually, I think I didn't say, do Jews go to hell? I said, oh, do Missouri Synod Lutherans go to hell? Because, I, like I said, the denomination wars in our, church, in our town were very fierce. So, you know, the Baptists, Lutherans, they're all going to hell, but Methodists, we were golden. So... I remember she said something, you know, first she responded with a boob and Adam. And then she started into her traditional, you know, my traditional grandmother rant. She went, you know, well, my good friend only says that Missouri Sin Lutherans are going to heaven and that everyone else is going to hell because they don't take communion at the same time as we. And, but I just don't believe that. I mean, what about the Jews? And what about the Unitarians? And she would always say Unitarians in one of those tones. And it was, it was so funny to me because she would always end on that. She'd always be like, what about the Unitarians? But she would get frustrated and she would say, it shouldn't be about how loud, it shouldn't be about how loud you're praying and how loud you're worshiping and how high your hands are raised or if your hands are raised at all, but instead it should be about the good deeds you're doing for your fellow men and for the people that mean the most to you in your life. And that, that philosophy just always made sense to me. It just always, I never questioned it. So I eventually stopped going to youth group B. Um, I, and when I stopped, I was probably 17. I had a year in high school left, and I just kind of floated around the idea of Christianity for that year because I just really wasn't sure what I believed. And so when I came to Champaign, it felt like coming to a completely different religious world. Like, there was more than five people in this city that don't believe in God or that don't believe in Jesus as the Savior or that don't believe in these things. And, you know, I met so many people and so many, like, opportunities arose to me. I could go to these different churches. I met people that believed in one God or three gods or hundreds of gods or goddesses or science or the force. I met a lot of people who believed in the force and I just really wanted to get into that because I like Star Wars and that's cool. And so I just kind of started asking about it and you know I really wanted to start learning more about that. So I'm like I'm going to take some religions classes because I really am interested in this. So I went to um, so I went and I signed up for uh, Religious Studies 110, which is World Religions, and you just kind of go over all of them. It's a survey class. And I remember talking to some people from my high school, and they were like, well, why are you going to do that? Because it's only going to lead you to question your faith. And that's exactly what I wanted. I mean, I wanted to question faith in general and be sure that I believed what I believed because I truly do believe it. And so I took the course, and I was just exhilarated by the tranquility of Buddhism and the practices of Hinduism and the history of Judaism and Christianity and the spiritual relationship with nature of all these different religions that have no name in Africa and the Americas and all these places. And But while going through this belief, I still thought, I'm like, you know, I do believe in Jesus and the Bible and Christianity. I do believe that. And I was like, but I do believe in these other things a little bit too. And I tried to get to the core of what was similar between them. And I feel like that similarity is encompassed by 
do good, and love each other. I mean, all religions seem to have this at the core. It's mentioned in the Quran. It's mentioned in um, the book. Uh, I can't say it. I'm going to mess it up. The Bhagavad Gita. And it's mentioned in all these different biblical texts, religious texts. It's mentioned so much. I mean, in 1 John 4, it said, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. So if you know love, you know God, because loving someone else is showing that form of God. And so, I mean, I grew up in a town that believed that non-Christians go to hell because they are godless, but how am I supposed to believe that my Muslim friend who prays for LGBT rights, or my atheist friend who offers to get me soup when I'm sick, or my Jewish friend who makes me laugh so hard that I cry, are going to hell? I can't believe that, and I just, I just can't believe that at all, and it's not in my soul, and it's not in my spirit for me to take that up as a belief. Because just because they have different rituals and different names, they too know love and they too know God. So I look back now to my high school career in youth group B, and I think of that evangelical retreat. And I was supposed to share and spread my love for God to other people who do not know about God. And I was supposed to tell them that they need to know about God. But I feel like it's switched because I don't know if they know about God or not. And a lot of them, I feel like they know they about, know about God. God through that. So instead of telling someone that they have to be a Christian and they have to go to church A or church B, I decided I wanted to start, I wanted to be able to make them laugh. And I wanted to be able to know that I'm thinking about them when they're struggling. Or I wanted them to know that I would make them soup when they're sick, or I would drive them to the airport, or I would like a picture of theirs on Facebook and tell them that their hair looks great, because that is spreading love and that is showing them that I do care and that I, I want to show them that I love them no matter what. And that is the essence of God. And so by spreading a little bit of love, I believe that it is possible to spread a little bit of God. Thank you.